listeners from around the world. Are you ready? Do you love movies, music, animation, and art? Acting, gaming, and all things creative? Well, you've come to the right place. Introducing your host, award-winning writer, director, voiceover artist, and owner of MLA Entertainment, Keiko! everyone, Keiko here. Thank you for joining me for another episode of Keiko's Diary, your favorite podcast for all things entertaining and creative. While I wear many hats, I consider myself first and foremost a storyteller. And that's why I started this podcast, to connect with other creative minds and share their stories. Plus, have a great time while doing it. <laughs> we have got a super special episode in store for you with an even more special guest. But first, Shameless Plugging. Hop on over to our YouTube channel, MLA Entertainment, and watch our original web series, Project Infinity. It's got a voice cast from New York to Japan to Australia, a thrilling action sci-fi story, and hours of love and hard work poured into it. I wouldn't suggest it if it wasn't worthy of your time, so go and take a look. Also, like, subscribe, and leave your questions and comments to show your support for this podcast and MLA. Now on with the show! He has a charm and star quality that shines through in absolutely everything he does. He shares his vast depth of knowledge with all of us to help us on our writing journey. His debut fantasy novella, The Sultan's Daughter, is out now, and its follow-up, The Kingdom's Protector, is out August 26th. Everyone, say hello to my good friend! It was too much responsibility for someone so unqualified. I'll do my best, she said feebly. I know you will do better than that. Sultan Dakwan said, warmly, smiling under the mask. Just remember that the kingdom exists in a delicate balance. Do everything you can to keep it together. P.E. E. Gilbert. Hello. Thank you, Keiko. You are so kind, honestly. Oh, well, I'm so happy to have you on the show, Paul. You're one of my good friends, and you're just so interesting and so knowledgeable. So could you tell the listeners just a little summary about yourself and what you do? Well, first, right back at you, Keiko, because you're a star as well. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, my name is Paul. I come from Golders Green, London in the United Kingdom. I studied history at university and then spent over a decade writing fantasy books in my room at night time. And last year, I self-published my first fantasy novella, The Sultan's Daughter. And later this month, on the 26th of August, I will be self-publishing the second in The Sultan's Daughter duology, which is called The Kingdom's Protector. And we're so excited about it. I read the first and it was just so lovely. And I just, I can't even imagine what's in store for the sequel. So I know everyone's looking forward to it. So let's take things back to the very beginning of your story. What is your first memory of life? I would say that my first memory, and you know, I really have to go back on this one. I have so many memories that I think of. Uh, but I would say my first was when I was about two years old and every Passover or Easter, we would go to one of my cousin's houses for a tea. And it was always such a lovely occasion. Always, we always had so much fun with my cousins there. But they, have, they had this dog that looked like Spot the dog. They even called her Spot. And everyone tells me how lovely and cuddly and friendly she was. But to me as a two-year-old, she just went at me like a wolf. I was absolutely terrified. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why she was so aggressive all of a sudden. <laughs> I, I think it's more my memory rather than what actually happened. But I just remember being absolutely terrified and wanting to go home at first. And it took a while for me to appreciate that this dog was actually friendly and nice. But even in my memory, when I think of Spot now, I still think of that moment. So... <laughs> I've recovered, put it that way. Yes. Well, I'm glad you've recovered. You can put that into your writing for sure, that experience. <laughs> <laughs> Similar ones accordingly. Maybe my protagonists or antagonists will meet wolves or something like that. And then you'll know where the inspiration came from. <laughs> <laughs> That's for sure. And so what was life like for you as a child? And when did you first discover your love for writing? Oh, I was really lucky. Um, my childhood was really nice. Yeah, I come from a loving, great, warm, friendly and welcoming family. The same is true for my relatives. I went to a really nice primary school where I met some really good people and I'm still in touch with many of them 
and that I consider many of them as good friends. So really lucky and I've only really got positive things to say about my childhood. Very lucky on that front. Um, in terms of where I found my love for writing, that would also be in primary school. Uh, when I was about eight years old in year four, uh, my teacher made us, oh, that means our class, uh, <laughs> write about going back in time to the dinosaurs. And it was really there where it just captured my imagination. And you know, I just kept writing and writing. I think I even spent more time writing that day than doing anything else, something useful like maths, for example, or science. But um, afterwards, my teacher actually did read out my story in class. And she did it because it was an example of what not to do. Remember I said I made some good friends in primary school? Well, as it happens, I also talked about it, those who didn't make it back from the dinosaur world, because some of them, well, had come in contact with the dinosaur, shall we say. I wasn't as popular after that, and maybe some of them still hold it against me. <laughs> I don't know. But um, no, joking aside, um, it was very nice that she read it out, and it made me realize that this is something I really enjoy doing. But it didn't automatically start me on my way to becoming a fantasy author. That comes a bit later. That is so interesting, and that's very early on that you had sort of your exposure to what you could do with your writing. No, oh, thank you. Yes. So why don't we take a, a little detour and play a fun game that I like to call the, the 60 Second 411. Let's go for it. Yes, I've got 15 questions for you, and I've got a stopwatch, and I'm going to see how many questions you can get answered in 60 seconds. So do you think you're ready? Let's go. Let's go for it. Starting the timer in three, two, one. Favorite color? Maroon. Favorite movie? Whitlash. Favorite song? Oh, that's a hard one. Uh, Enya, Now We Are Free from Gladiator. Ooh, favorite TV show? The Last Kingdom. Oops, sorry. Project Infinity. What was I saying? Thank you. Greatest fear? Oh, uh, Missing Lunch. Hot or cold weather? Hot. Night Owl or Morning Bird? Night Owl. Favorite game? Coup or Badminton. Mm, favorite food? Spaghetti Bolognese. Ooh, favorite book? Oh, that's another hard one. Animal Farm. Ooh, favorite subject in school? History. Yes, favorite place in the world? Jerusalem. Biggest pet peeve? Oh, someone leaning across me while I'm eating. <laughs> I'm <driving> mad. <laughs> favorite Spice Girl? Oh, for goodness sake. Posh Spice. Yeah, indoors or outdoors? <laughs> outdoors, ironically. You did it, Paul! You did it! Yay! Yes, that's awesome. You had like one or two seconds to spare, too. <laughs> oh, great. Good job. That was great game. Enjoyed it a lot. Yes, you're very quick on your feet. <laughs> I try. Well, I try. Thank you. Yes, absolutely. And you said your favorite subject is your is history. And uh, that is something just that I really admire about you is your love for history. And I could just listen to you talk about historical topics for hours. It's so interesting. And you actually studied oh, history. You. Yeah, you actually studied history at the University mm -hmm. of Birmingham. So could you tell us about your time as a student and why you chose history? My time as a student was a great one. Again, met some great people, many of whom I'm still in touch with today. Um, I really enjoyed my studies and the other things that go with being a student as well. Had my fun, it's fair to say, at night time. Uh, what good student doesn't? Um, as for why I chose history, simply I've always loved it and I'm fascinated by history. Uh, for instance, why, do, why is history recorded the way it is? Why do rulers uh, make the decisions that they do? What was going on at the time? Why? How? When? Why are nations the way they are? And then there's another element that I learned whilst being a student, and that is history almost on a meta level. And that is, as I hinted at, why is history recorded in the way that it is? Again, who writes it? When did that person write it? Why did they write it? And what's going on in wider society? And very often one finds, at least I have found, that what the historian says and what he writes about tells us more about the era that he is writing in than it, than it does about the past. And I find that really fascinating. So overall, that's why I studied it and it's why I continue to read history even now, 12 years on from finishing my degree. Yes. And that's the thing about history is it's ongoing. 
So Very much so. You've hit a really good point there, Keiko, because history actually isn't about the past. It's perspective on past events, why they happened. And the perspective is always a reflective of the present. And the way I tell most people about what history is, think about when you went to primary school. When you were there, your uh, experience of primary school is very different to how you looked at it you know, a few years into high school. And even now, why is that? The past didn't change, but you have. It's like in Pocahontas, as she says, you can't step into the same river twice. The same is true for history, because yeah. you change, we change. And I love that element to it. So you can read the same facts for argument's sakes, but in very different ways. And that tells us a lot about the historian uh, and what time period he's in. Very good point. That is so interesting. Well, thank you. Yes. And after thank your you. time at university, you spent the next decade writing a fantasy series. That is yes. quite an undertaking, I must say. <laughs> so could you tell us thank about you. this and if we'll ever see this series? Sure. Um, well, actually, after university, it was oh, it was oh nine. Uh, it was the height of the credit crunch. So I actually found myself unemployed with, as you can imagine, not a lot to do during my days. So I figured, well, I know tons of historical events. I love history, mythology, fantasy. I, I had all these ideas in my mind. And I thought, you got to do something with your time, Paul. Come on. So I've always loved writing, as I've already hinted at. So I thought now, well, not now, back then in July 2009, it was the perfect time to start writing. And so I did. And I've never looked back. The story that I've, that I've written about that is still not out there yet, sadly, is... Um, it's called Blood and Defiance, at least that, that's its working title. And it centers around multiple points of view. But the main one, if we can call him the main character, I mean, there are other points of view characters after all. But it's about an upstart young nobleman who's a famous knight, and he wants to become a symbol of justice. Mm -hmm. And it's about the terrible price he pays for his ambitions. But need I say any more after that uh, with regards to the plot? As to if you'll ever see it, of course, one day you will, please God. I don't know when that will be, and it will be a while still, because there are other books that I want to write first. Um, I've sadly not been writing it for a while, but I will come back to it, and I will finish the trilogy. No two ways about it. I've poured so much effort into it. I believe it's a great story, and I believe it's a story worth telling. So it has to come out one day. That's just the way I look at it. If you have a story worth telling, I say this to everybody, just write it, get it out there. Yes, I love that. And I believe you have many stories worth telling. So I can't wait for us to see all of them eventually. <laughs> oh, you are, you are very kind, Keiko. Thank yes. you. Yes. So why don't we talk about your, day blue, your debut novella, The Sultan's Daughter. I read it and I Ooh. immediately fell in love with it. Your writing style just has such a flow and an immersive feel to it. And it's really a beautiful book. So everyone go get your copy on Amazon and the sequel will be out at the end of this month. So look forward to that. Uh, so when did you first start working on the novella and what made you decide to debut with it? Um, first, thank you again, Keiko. Your words humble me, honestly. I'm so happy that you enjoyed it. And maybe, just maybe, spending more than 10 years at my desk has borne some kind of fruits after all. Uh, it can be a very lonely process, as you, as you probably are aware, writing at your desk every night. <laughs> <laughs> um, what made me start writing it? Uh, why did I debut with The Sultan's Daughter? I was looking to write a short book, a novella, for a while. I would say probably about a year, something like that. And I was thinking, what, do, what am I going to write? What am I going to write? And I was reading John Mann's, or should I say Professor John Mann's biography on Saladin. And one of the things that I found really interesting in the book was that Richard the Lionheart offered his sister, Joanna Plantagenet, to one of Saladin's brothers. It never materialized, but I thought, imagine if that had happened. How cool would that have been? And at the same time, as I was reading this book in June 2019, the new Aladdin film, the live action version, came out. And I thought, well, imagine if Jasmine had been married to a crusader knight. Although my main character, Nalini's personality, is very different to Princess Jasmine's. But you'll have to read it to find out what I mean by that. <laughs> Yes, it's such an enjoyable book. And that is one part that I really enjoy are the characters. 
The characters are just so fleshed out and you do it so quickly. Like with very little information, it's really, it's really a gift to be able to do that. I'm an, I was an editor in my previous job. I believe that brevity is the best way of getting a message across. Make it as clear cut and emotive as possible. And that's generally speaking what I like to read, what I want to read. So that's what I want to give you guys. I try, put it that way. Well, and you thank you again, Keiko. You're very welcome. You try and you succeed. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, thank you. Appreciate that a lot. Now, without giving too much away, could you give the listeners a little taste of what the novella and its follow-up are about? Mm -hmm. Okay, sure. I'd be honored to. So the first book is called The Sultan's Daughter in the Sultan's Daughter Duology. And it centers very simply around the Sultan's daughter, Princess Nalini. At the start of the book, her father is on his deathbed and he tells her, to her immense surprise, that the kingdom's fate is basically in her hands. If she doesn't hold it together, it's going to fall apart because there is an army of frightening fanatics, i.e. religious fundamentalist nutcases, on the way to destroy everything that she's ever known. Now, Nalini has never been trained for rule or war before, but she has to adapt and she has to adapt quickly or else ruin faces her and her family and everything that she holds dear. That is, in essence, the first book. The second book, it continues on a similar theme, particularly with the religious fanaticism. Uh, the key difference, though, this time is that there is an existential crisis in the form of a drought. Imagine in Egypt, for instance, if the one source of water, the Nile, dries up or turns to blood like it did in the Exodus stories. And I think to myself, what would a medieval ruler do if there is a drought, there's a heat wave, and there's no water? Literally, what would you do as a ruler? And also, how would those under you be affected? What would they do to demand that you take action? And that is essentially the story. And here we go again. Nalini faces yet another crisis to hold the kingdom together. And simply, if you were in her shoes, would you do this? Would you... Um, take the same measures that she does? Would you react differently? That's for you to decide. But I would like to think that people can at least empathize again with her situation and the decisions that she makes under the circumstances. I've tried to make them as plausible, real and believable as possible. Yes, it feels very natural. It doesn't feel like it was written beforehand. It just feels like you're kind of peering into these people's lives and witnessing mm -hmm. them make the choices on the spur of the moment. I cannot tell you how much that means to me, Keiko, because that is exactly what I do. Um, I'm, I, do I write from the point of view limited character or the third point of view limited character. You are basically in someone's shoes. You see what Nalini sees and only what she sees as it happens. There's no foresight here. And it is basically reacting as and when events happen. And so thank you so much again. That means so much to me. Yes. Could you tell us some of the inspirations you had for the characters in this story and even the setting? Because it's so it's so well crafted, the, the setting and the kingdom mm -hmm. and even the religious aspect of it. So could you tell us a little bit more about how you came up with all that? Um, I live in the Middle East. And although I'm from London, I actually live in the Middle East these days. And, you know, this is a region very close to my heart. And I really wanted the story to be in this region uh, for, because it's, it's so emotive in so many ways. It really brings out the best and the worst in people. I can tell you that for fact. Um, in terms of some of my inspirations, again, it's hard to ignore Princess Jasmine and Aladdin from, you know, an Arabian style kingdom. I wanted it in Egypt because an Egypt style kingdom, because Egypt is a regional powerhouse in the Middle East since the biblical days, since the story of Exodus even going back before then. I wanted a character in, in the form of the main character, Nalini, who you would recognize as a Jasmine-esque character from Aladdin, but without her confidence and strength so much, or rephrase that, Nalini has strength, but not in the traditional strong sense. She doesn't shout, she has to use political human. She has to think before she speaks very often, uh, which is a complete, which is completely contrary to the Mary Sues we see a lot. She cannot rely on her physical strength because she doesn't have any. She's not a man. 
So she can't give orders and expect to be listened to. She has to act more like a Margaret of Anjou from the Wars of the Roses. So definitely those were elements that I was looking to. You look, um, you know, the different power struggles of the families. Uh, again, you look at the Wars of the Roses for me, but you can look at any area in history and see nobles and barons, you know, wanting something the king won't give them. So they, re so they revolt. Um, in terms of our villain, and I know you love villains because you've got a fantastic one in the form of Calanth yourself. I look at someone like a Margaret Beaufort, according to Philippa Gregory's uh, version of the character. And I don't want to say too much, but it's this idea of religious fanaticism that pretty much, you know, so much can be justified in the name of religion, in, the, in terms of, of um, you know, everything can be done in terms of what, what the book says which you know it doesn't matter to these people to some extent how many people die their sacrifice is worthwhile because it's all for the greater good of their cause and that's something i find really terrifying because there's nothing you can do against a religious fundamentalist nutcase who believes with absolute conviction that he or she is right to me that is absolutely terrifying um, an example of that in popular in popular films would be Bane from The Dark Knight Rises. Mm. While he's not a religious figure as we understand it, he could definitely be seen as some kind of a cult leader who has an absolute following and believes fanatically that everything he's doing is right, even to the point of you know killing himself, blowing up all of Gotham for his greater purpose. And we see this today with I don't even need to state you know, which religions we're talking about, whether it's Islam or it's Christianity in times gone by, Zoroastrianism in previous eras. Um, I really find that always interesting, you know, what makes people become this way. And so, yeah, I try to throw all those elements into it. And the last um, instance I'll give you in terms of what's inspired me is Columbus in 1492, this idea of finding the East via the West, which one of our characters, Palab, is obsessed with for reasons of glory, for reasons of wanting to find new lands, for reasons to find, um, you know, to put himself in the history books. He's a vain character and he's very open about that. Yeah. And you half feel that someone like a Colombian figure would be like that. And I love that. I love throwing that into it because you can really understand then the time period we're talking about. Finding the East via the West is very much around 1492 as well. So those were just some of the elements that I threw into the story. As I say, you know, when it comes to talking about Egypt as well, you know, it's not just uh, the Islamic conquest of it that springs to mind, but also it's Pharaoh days as well. And there are hints of that still with one of the peoples, um, with their mysticism and their belief in their ancestral deities to some extent just morphed you know into this into the religion that i've created of abya so those are my inspirations and we see this time and time again when new religions conquer old ones you see some kind of um synthesis of the two so i hope again that comes across it certainly does it's so believable and there were times i wondered is this religion real because it was so convincing <laughs> How you would have developed it? Uh, uh, the uh, well, it's listen. There are it's heavily influenced by Islam. No two ways about it. I am not Islamic. I want to put it out there. Um, I have massive interest in studying it. Always have done. I still read about it. Um, no, I, I've made it up, and I you flatter me, honestly, Keiko, because. I don't believe any single human being, at least not myself, could create um, the regional complexity that is the Middle and Near East with all the Christian elements to it, the, you know, the ancient religions, the Islamic, the Jewish, you know, the conflicts that come into it, the Crusades, uh, that you're telling me that you could almost believe that this is an alternate world to our own really, really humbles me. So thank you. You're very welcome. And when you aren't writing masterpieces, you are also a blogger <laughs> and a YouTuber who offers invaluable writing tips. You also interview people from all over the world about their various crafts, which is, is so wonderful. So what compelled you to begin your YouTube career and blogging? Well, the blogging came first. Um, simply, you know, I want to help people improve their craft. And one of my areas of expertise after spending more than 10 years at my desk is story writing. What makes a great story, or, or at least an engaging one rather. I, 
And you know, I've had a mentor in the past who was fantastic, who helped me so much. And if I can do that, if I can just give someone some snippet of advice that they can use and make their story that bit better in their eyes and, and their readers, then I've done my job and I really enjoy it. And YouTubing was very much just a furtherance of that, quite honestly. Um, it's a great way to get yourself out there, to meet great people like yourself, Keiko, other creatives, and I've really enjoyed it. Yes, and that is so evident in every video you make. <laughs> oh, thank you. Yes. And your content is just so well made and thoughtful. So what is the typical process of making your writing videos and your blogs? Um, good question. I would say as a starting point, you know, let's say you have a theory for argument's sakes, you know, a standard one. What makes a great protagonist? You know, I, you know, you, I think of ways that, in my opinion, make a great protagonist. And so I give, you know, breakdowns of that, uh, whether it's, you know, the types of personality traits you want, the story arc, his flaws, his, and in particular, the one I love most is the internal conflict. And then very simply, I give, you know, I always think of an example to go with it. I'll never give um, a theory without an example, because as a historian, if you make a point, you've got to have an example to back it up. And I do that with pretty much everything that I write or what, and have done since my A-levels when I was about 18 years old. And, you know, it goes from there, you know, the more you, you focus on a craft, the more you find, the more areas of expertise you acquire, the more you think about it. And the last point I would say to you is anything I write, whether that's, a, you know, whether that's an essay, it's a blog piece, a video script or a speech, it should be a story of some kind. And it's always a case of, well, introducing it and then, or, you know, you do that in an organic way, hopefully. And then you build up to the climax, the best point, and then you conclude, really. And that's kind of my approach. And hopefully it works in most cases. And where it doesn't, well, then you hope that there's a to be continued, something like that, so you can finish it off next time. Yes, what a good approach, even if it's not necessarily a book or a novel. I mean, just write it as a story. <laughs> mm -hmm. that's yeah, and that's the way to captivate and engage people, in my opinion. Um, yeah, that's been my natural approach, really, for a very long time. And you know, judge for yourself if it works or not, if you enjoy my content. Yes, go check it out. He's got a video on just about everything. It is so good. <laughs> Thank you. So from your writing tips to your knowledge of history, to interviews, to publishing novellas, you're quite the well-rounded individual. So what is your favorite part about what you do? Um, good question again. It's a challenging one. I would say simply, it's all parts of it. That sounds like a massive cop-out, I know, <laughs> but I really do or else I wouldn't do it because you know, at the start, when you, let's say, you put down all your ideas, you've got the notes there and there, and you think, now's the time to start. And you need a gargantuan amount of energy to start, particularly if you're going to start a novel. But you also need that. There's the struggle element to it when it comes to writing. It's a massive struggle often, often and it never gets any easier, always, which always surprises me. I'm always hoping it gets easier. <laughs> it never does. And you always need that energy, that willpower to keep going. And even though it gives me a migraine more often than I'd like to admit, um, I enjoy it all. I enjoy every part of it, whether it's crafting a sentence, you know, formulating the idea, even throwing the idea out for why it can't work here and there, even if it might be a fantastic idea, one I really want to include. You know, sometimes you just got to say, no, it doesn't work in this context. You know, there'll be another occasion for it. Even elements like that I enjoy, you know, I, I enjoy the satisfaction of crafting, of sitting there and actually doing it, because that's, that is the process. A friend of mine said, enjoy the journey. And mm -hmm. I think that's the best pe one of the best pieces of advice I've ever heard. Because if you don't enjoy the journey, no disrespect, but it will show. Your writing quality or whatever you're producing won't be as good. You might get away with it once or twice, but overall, people will see a decline in quality. So no, I really enjoy the process and Equally, um, you know, I also love seeing it finished and thinking, what am I going to do now? Because no sooner have I finished what I've done, I think about what I've got to do next. I don't really think about what I did yesterday anymore, unless it's relevant to today. 
you know what's what's next and you know i love that part of it too that excites me so again i would say to you all of it especially the hard parts yes i love that and i feel you there i immediately when i finish something instead of enjoying ha- having it done and relaxing you're on to the next thing <laughs> it's, you know, it's i i totally empathize with that keiko and you know even sometimes my friends and families tell me you know go out and get yourself a steak make yourself a barbecue you know do something to actually celebrate what you've done because otherwise <laughs> i just forget and not even because it's not willful it's just i'm already thinking well, what have i got to do now exactly um, so yeah i mean i totally get you keiko but i would say to you particularly after the finale that you just had for project infinity you know you do enjoy ce- you should enjoy a celebration as well Oh, well, thank you very much. That makes two of us. <laughs> now, why don't we play another game, which is... Truth or Dare? <laughs> oh, God. I sense danger already, but let's go. Like, go on. Let's go for it. Oh, it'll be all right. You've got this. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Paul. Truth or Dare? We'll start with truth. All right. Is there something surprising about you that people may not know? Uh, it depends who is the is the quick answer to that. It's the easy cop out, I would guess. <laughs> uh, but I would say I have a monstrous, ferocious appetite. Uh, funny story. Once I went with a friend to an all you can eat place, and I ate a multi. It was a steakhouse. I ate a multitude of chicken wings, more than it's than it should be possible to eat for someone who is so slim <laughs> as well. And then I had three steaks with chips on the side, rice, bread. And I wanted to order a fourth, and he reminded me we needed to get the bus home. So, <laughs> so it put, put a stop in my tracks. He was actually quite right. I'd eaten far too much. It was disgraceful. But yeah, I have a monstrous appetite, and it only seems to increase. That is hilarious. You're so good at describing things. I've never heard it said a monstrous, ferocious appetite. That is so funny. <laughs> Thank you. We need to get that on a t-shirt. <laughs> I trademark it. Yeah. (laughs) All right. Truth or dare? Dare this time. Could you read a sample of your novella to entice the listeners? (laughs) Okay. Chapter one, The Threat from the East. Nalini stared at her father as if he had gone mad. Father, I, I, I will do what I can, she said. But no woman has ever been a vizier at court before. And now you want to make me the vizier for the treasury? There, there will be uproar, and I am untrained for the position. Surely you can find someone more qualified than me. Sultan Dakwan, lying on his bed, coughed weakly under the mask. Princess Nalini Reba, his 23-year-old daughter, filled the cup next to him with water. She would have handed it to him, but the physicians forbade it, lest he touch her and infect her with skin scales. Slowly, Sultan Dakwan sat up and raised his mask enough so that he could sip the water and so that Nalini could see the swords that had disfigured his once proud, handsome face. I was never trained to be Sultan, he said after a couple of sips. You are my daughter, and you did a better job at maintaining the castle during the revolt than either my counsellors or I ever did. You can learn how to manage the accounts of the kingdom. More importantly, you are the only person who Razilan listens to. He does, she thought. She had never known her oldest brother, the heir to the throne of al Jaraba, to heed what she had said before. What in the charted world gave her father the idea that Prince Razilan would suddenly start now? There is more to you than caring for a sick man, her father continued. Will you do this for me? Will you become my vizier? Nalini pressed her lips together and gulped. She had always been a devoted daughter and had done as she had been asked. She had run the castle at Greatmouth during her father's revolt married a foreign heathen and stayed by her father's bed after he had become ill, all because he had asked her. Yet, she had never been asked to do something on the magnitude of managing a kingdom before. It was too much responsibility for someone so unqualified. I'll do my best, she said feebly. I know you will do better than that, Sultan Dakwan said warmly, smiling under the mask. Just remember that the kingdom exists in a delicate balance. Do everything you can to keep it together. Oh my goodness. The chills are there. The chills are there. Oh, thank you. You're the voice the voice actress though, not me. You should be the one reading it. Yes, I would I would play Nalini. <laughs> that was <laughs> be a great Nalini. 
Well, thank you very much. That was just wonderful. And listeners, that was a very exclusive event that we just that just took place. That was very special hearing from the author himself. (laughs) Thanks again. Wonderful. And it shows so much about the characters in just a couple pages. It's fantastic. Oh, thank you. Yes. All right. Now, truth or dare? I'll do another dare. Go on. I'll probably regret it. (laughs) Oh, no. I think you can do this. Uh, How about patting your head and rubbing your tummy at the same time? Can you do that? You can't really see my tummy here. How about your chest? uh, Okay. You can do it. (laughs) I've mucked up my hair now. Keiko, you've mucked up the hair. Oh, it looks good. (laughs) Yeah. You pull it off. (laughs) Oh, thanks. You're too kind. Mm -hmm. Took some coordination there. Very good. (laughs) Truth or dare? We'll go with another truth. All right. What is the craziest thing you've ever done in your life? I clearly haven't done enough crazy things to be worthy of such a question. But I think getting up and leaving London and moving country to the Middle East was definitely the craziest thing I've ever done. I shocked my family in May 2017 because out of nowhere I said, I'm moving and I leave in six weeks. Wow. And that really? was that. Yeah. Very interesting. Well, I would say that that is a good answer to the question. <laughs> oh, you're thank you. I didn't think it was crazy enough. I haven't jumped into, you know, lakes with snakes or anything like that, or done bungee jumping or tried various foods or been on Love Island or anything as bonkers as that. <laughs> we'll save the snake lake for one of your novels. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? I'll have, a, I'll have the villain throw someone into a snake pit. Who are we kidding? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And last, truth or dare? I'll take a dare. All right. Can you say the tongue twister? Peter Piper picked a peck of pickled peppers three times fast simple answer is no because I, I can't even remember what you said peter piper picked a pickled herring what <laughs> <laughs> that was actually pretty good it's peter piper picked a peck of pickled peppers peter piper picked a peck of pickled peppers peter piper picked a pet peter piper picked a peckle of pickled peckers <laughs> i'm hopeless oh that is wonderful you invented some new words there <laughs> If only they actually meant something. (laughs) (laughs) That is so much fun. Thank you for playing that, Paul. That was a lot of fun. My pleasure. It was a lot of fun. I love inventing new words. It's one of the things I want to do in life. I want to have a word from me that goes into the English language one day. Oh, I think that it could be done. That is a very interesting thing to take on. (laughs) I hope hope so. One day. I have time, please, God. (laughs) Yes, bucket list. So with someone as busy as you are, I'm sure that we would all love to know what you enjoy doing in the spare time that you do have. (laughs) Good question. Um, Do you consider spare time to be outside of day jobs or um, outside of all the writing and other things we've described or as as I see fit? Yes. uh, Either way, whenever you're just not working and you can just have time to just do as you please, what do you choose to do with your time? (laughs) Okay, so we'll define um, spare time as not in my day job. Um, (laughs) Well, writing is a starting point. I love writing and I do that every night until very late hours. Um, I love to play badminton. I, I love to go to the gym, keep fit. I enjoy cooking. I, I love eating as well, I should say. You'd never believe it, but I do. Um, I love watching football or soccer, as you would say, in the US. I haven't watched too many of, of games, though, at least excluding the Euros due to the pandemic and bars were closed. Um, and last but not least, I love you know speaking to my friends, keeping up with people. I would say socializing again, but that stopped as a result of the pandemic. So, yeah, keeping up with friends and family, whether it's on Zoom, whether it's on the phone, just via WhatsApp. I love doing that. So simple answer is exercising, eating, keeping up with with good people. Well, that sounds like a very oh, and good writing time. and writing. How did I forget that one? Yeah, I can't forget that. That's the main one. <laughs> <laughs> well, that is a wonderful use of your spare time. <laughs> now, what are your goals and plans for the future, Paul? 
Well, on the 26th of August, the Kingdom's Protector is coming out. So I'm very much thinking about that. I'm really excited to get the second book out. It's taken me almost a year to get to this point. So that's the first thing in my mind. After this, I'm going to take a bit of a break from writing, you know, rest my creativity and, you know, come up with my next story. Um, that's another thing I have to do because I've been do I've been writing solidly for more than two years now. I just feel a little bit of time out. It will be good for me. Uh, I'm going to rebrand my YouTube channel. Uh, I'm not entirely sure with everything about it yet, but all in good time, it will become clear. And uh, you know, try again, socialising a bit more, going to the gym, keeping fit. It's not really great long-term goals at the moment, I would say to you. But you know, coming up with one or two other things, ideas for the next book, that'll keep me busy. You know, it takes time to formulate a plot. It doesn't, sadly, it doesn't just happen because I snap my fingers. It takes weeks and weeks of work. And even then, you know, it takes months, five, six months to write a first draft, etc. So gearing up for that, I think, would be a starting point for my plans. Maybe a barbecue as well here and there before summer's out. That'd be good. Yes, you need to squeeze one or two of those in there. <laughs> oh, definitely. I love barbecues. <laughs> yes, of course. <laughs> now, as we begin to wrap up this episode, could you tell the listeners where they can best keep up with you and your work? Sure. Um, my blog is paulsfantasywritings.com. On Instagram, I'm P.E. Gilbert Author. And the same is true on YouTube as well, P.E. Gilbert Author. You can find me there, or you can email me at pegilbertauthor at gmail.com. And if you want to go to Amazon and type in The Sultan's Daughter or The Kingdom's Protector, you can find me there as well, hopefully in time. You know, particularly not only on the 26th of this month, but in time there'll be more books up than the one there is now. Yes, go do it, people. It is so worth your time. It's really good stories. Well, thank you. Really, that means so much to me. Yes, you're welcome. And thank you for all the great work you're putting out because writing is just such a wonderful craft, but it can be daunting for those first starting out. So the fact that you're willing to share what you've learned through all the years of hard work and dedication is very commendable. So thank you. Well, thank you. And I, could say, I can also say to back that up, not only is it daunting to start with, it's even more daunting as you continue over the years. You know, in case you think the first draft is Mount Everest, believe it or not, the mountain gets steeper and higher. You've only just made it to the first cloud line. You know? So, yeah, I mean, I really I admire everyone who writes and, you know, who writes a book or creates YouTube content. I think it's fantastic and wonderful. And I appreciate all that goes into it, particularly the suffering. <laughs> Yes, it's worth the suffering. You heard it from Paul. <laughs> Definitely. When I get to hold the kingdom's protector, as I did with the Sultan's daughter before that, sorry, that's a bad background. Um, you know, it's one of the most satisfying feelings to have your work in front of you, whether that's your book in your own hands or on Kindle or, you know, watching your videos, you know, when you've put it up. It is so satisfying. Keiko, I'm, I'm pretty sure you empathize with this as well. It's a wonderful feeling. And I hope you guys feel exactly the same way when you've put your, when you've put your work out there and when others have watched or read it and have enjoyed it, as I'm sure they do. Well, that is it for another episode of Keiko's Diary. I want to say thank you to our listeners for their love and support, as well as P.E. Gilbert for joining us. Thank you, Keiko. It has been an absolute honor. I've really enjoyed it. And I hope you, my audience, have enjoyed it as well. Or rather, Keiko's audience has enjoyed listening to me and Keiko as well today. Oh, I know that they have. And before we go, Paul, could you say one last thing to our listeners? Well, in that case, there's only one thing to say, and that is go and watch Project Infinity, Keiko's original web series. I only came across it barely, a year, not even a year ago, actually and have fallen in love with it. And as mentioned previously, Keiko has created a phenomenal villain who is so believable and uh, engrossing. Um, I was totally hooked by it. I have loved every moment of it. And I'm excited to see where the show goes next. So go and watch Project Infinity at once. Thank you so much for that, Paul. That means a lot coming from you. Keep being creative, guys. It's worth it in the end. Thank you for listening to Keiko's Diary. If you enjoyed this episode, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. We would love to hear from you. 
Write questions and comments to show your support and share this podcast with your friends. We'll be back with another exciting episode before you know it. In the meantime, keep being creative.